Imagining Tomorrow with Emma Newman, created in partnership with Friends of the Earth. If you've felt any anxiety about the environmental crisis, I'd like to invite you on a journey with me. As a writer of dystopian science fiction, I know how easy it is to see how bad things could get. But some people are doing amazing things right now to combat or in some cases reverse environmental damage to create a better future for everyone. Join me as I explore their work and communities and imagine a tomorrow that is building hope in a changing climate instead of despair. Episode one, heating, cooling, empowering. Imagine a crisp autumnal morning, not too many years from now, and you're standing outside a renovated building, just a 10 minute walk from where you live. It used to be a large pub, but it shut down shortly after the pandemic, like thousands across the country. It stood empty for years. It was vandalised and partially burnt down. Like so many ex-mining towns, the local economy, which had been struggling for years, seemed trapped in a downward spiral. But then something changed. A community group sprung up campaigning for funding and support from the council to implement a radical new way to heat homes that doesn't release harmful gases into the atmosphere, alongside a better way to manage the infrastructure for transport powered by renewable energy to reduce local air pollution. And their campaign won. Years later, heat stored in miles of flooded mine tunnels beneath the town keeps everyone's homes warm in the winter and cool in the summer. You don't know how the system works, and it sounds like magic, but the neighbour's daughter has told you it has something to do with heat pumps powered by community-owned solar panels that have been erected over car parks and on the roofs of dozens of buildings. She's one of hundreds of people in the town that are now highly trained, highly sought-after engineers, helping to roll out the same technology across the country. People have jobs, security and pride again. Abandoned homes are being renovated. Streets are coming back to life. Now you're standing outside the new community centre, back in the ownership of the community, renovated and retrofitted, thanks to money made from selling surplus renewable energy to the national grid, crowdfunding and donated labour. The red ribbon across the door is cut and the crowd cheers before going into the warm, inviting space within. I love autumn. In my part of the world, we revel in the changing colours of leaves, unpack jumpers and jackets, and note how the nights are drawing in. Hot chocolate and mulled wine, casseroles and dumplings, crumbles and custard, can you tell it's my favourite season? But there's one thing I dread about this time of year. I leave it as late as possible, layering up my clothes, typing from under a blanket. But there's always a point when the house starts to feel too cold and laundered clothes don't dry and the towels stay wet. And with a sense of dread, I turn the heating on. And thus begins the season of worrying about the gas and electricity bills. The UK has a high percentage of homes that are old and poorly insulated. While our winters are, on average, not particularly cold, they are often wet and windy. For much of the 20th century, the damp and cold was kept out of houses by using coal, gas and oil to heat them. We're now almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century, and we're still doing it. As I look out of the window and watch the plumes of steam coming from my neighbour's heating exhausts, as well as my own, feeling guilty about the emissions as well as stressed about the bills, I can't help but wonder why we're still so reliant on fossil fuels to heat and power our homes. It's not that alternative technology doesn't exist. Heat pumps, solar panels and batteries for the domestic market are all well-established technologies and increasing in efficiency all the time. In the show notes, you can find a link to an impartial guide to the different options available produced by Friends of the Earth. But as they and other campaigning organisations point out, 
the cost of deploying these solutions is prohibitively expensive for the majority of the population. I, like so many, can't afford to get a heat pump or solar panels installed, no matter how much I would love to do so. If you rent, you have no control over how the house you live in is heated, nor how it is insulated. Is the only solution to wait for enough people who can afford them to have alternative technologies installed to bring down prices so the rest of us can afford it? Or is there a better way to accelerate decarbonisation of domestic heating and power? What if we looked at this from a completely different angle? and consider that heating homes may have more to do with cooling other buildings than we might have realised. That's one part of the solution that the team behind the Green Skies project have been working on. I'll leave it to Dr Caterina Marques, a senior research fellow at London South Bank University and one of the Green Skies project leaders, to explain what it is. So Green Skies really stands for Green Smart Community Integrated Energy System. Uh, it sounds complex, but is it essentially a new energy system for Islington residents and businesses? So Green Skies, what it does is it effectively integrates low carbon heat, power and transport. And let's have a look at heat first, because it really underpins the project. So in, in Green Skies, in the concept, uh, heat is delivered from a source to people's homes by a network of underground pipes. And this is what is known as a district heating network. And Islington already has district heating in the borough, so they are well experienced with it. Islington's district heating experience is thanks to the Bunhill 2 Energy Centre, which already heats over a thousand homes, a school and a couple of leisure centres, using excess heat from the London Underground. A huge fan sucks hot air from the Northern Line, which is used to heat water, and then its temperature is increased very efficiently by using heat pumps. That hot water is then pumped around a network of insulated underground pipes, and the heat is transferred to communal heating system loops on housing estates using heat exchangers. So what we did differently is we designed a low temperature network that is around 20 degrees, and this allows for heat recovery from a local source. So in this case, we were looking at recovering heat from a, a data centre, but it could be another source, it could be a supermarket, it could be a canal, it could be the industry. So. The source can vary depending on the local area. Data centres are a perfect heat source because they require constant cooling 24 hours a day to keep the computer servers working properly. The majority of data centres eject that unwanted heat into the atmosphere, so it not only goes to waste, it can also contribute to heating urban areas. A company called Deep Green is already using this to heat a swimming pool in Devon, so it's a proven concept. And it's brilliant. And what we can do is we can capture that heat into our heat network and then upgrade it using a heat pump to raise the temperature to that required for space heating and hot water in people's homes. Heat pumps are powered by electricity, which can come from a renewable source. So we investigated adding solar photovoltaics on the roofs of the buildings that would be connected to the network. So this kind of covers uh, the, let's say, the low carbon heat and power. But the Green Skies approach doesn't just cover the decarbonisation of heating and cooling. The low carbon transport comes from adding electric vehicle charging points along the heat network route. And, and this is actually a very effective way of doing it because what is really costly in the whole system, well, one of the things that's, that is costly is the trenching for fitting the heat network pipes. Just to give an idea, in Islington is around uh, 2,000 pounds per meter. So by combining the, um, the pipes with uh, electric vehicle charging cables in the same trench, we are reducing the cost you know, compared to doing it separately. 
So the green sky system is effectively replacing fossil fuels, such as natural gas that's used in conventional gas boilers and petrol and diesel vehicles, because we are replacing them with electric heat pumps and electric vehicles. And in doing so, the carbon emissions are reduced by 80% in the local area, and the air quality will improve too because we are displacing petrol and diesel vehicles. The Islington Green Skies Project aims to provide low-carbon heat, cooling and power to 33,000 homes and almost 80 businesses. It's an approach that considers the heating and cooling needs of different spaces holistically across the borough through a distributed system of energy hubs, all managed by a sophisticated AI system that minimises energy costs and maximises carbon savings. If systems like this were incorporated into new housing estates right from the very start, the infrastructure would be even easier and cheaper to install. And it would be cheaper for the residents to heat and cool their homes in a much more environmentally friendly way. So where are things at now? Is this all just theoretical? Well, phase one of the Green Skies project started in 2019. This is when we secured funding from Innovate UK to carry out a six-month feasibility study in Islington. And back then, it was the University, Islington Council, and, and you know five other partners with expertise in heat networks, in design and modelling, smart controls, electrical vehicles, and community engagement, which is quite critical. That community engagement has been extensive. Now that Phase 2 has been completed, which produced the detailed design, Islington Borough Council is in the process of securing the funding to implement it. Phase 3 looked at replication, looking at ways to roll out something similar in other parts of the country. I asked Dr Marques about the work that's been done in Barnsley, a town in South Yorkshire with an impressive industrial heritage. So what we looked at was industry because they have a lot of uh, local industry where we could recover heat from and the obvious one was a glass manufacturing facility so they have high grade heat in the furnaces and they have many different sources of heat but we actually just looked at process water heat which is they manufacture the glass bottles and then they need to cool them down so they drop them in water and that water is then collected into a lagoon. So it is like heat that they are really throwing down the drain. So we looked at recovering that heat. It wouldn't affect any of their processes. We don't need to do anything within the factory. We just need to recover the heat that goes into the lagoon. You know, it's, it's clear benefits. It doesn't affect their process. And is, we can recover large amounts of heat. So we looked at recovering the heat again into a heat network to supply uh, the local buildings. Another thing that's great about this area is is it has abandoned coal mines that have filled with water over time. So that's another source of heat. So we could recover heat from the mine water to heat the homes. Again, something we did that's a bit innovative there is we only need, we need heat mostly in the winter, but, you know, the glass factory is still producing heat in the summer. So why not store that heat in the mines and then recover it in the winter to supply the homes? So we did a bit of both. And the fact that we had these two heat sources gives a bit of resilience. You know, imagine the glass factory just moves on to a different location. Well, we still have the source there. And it also gives you, you know, you can heat more homes because you have two sources. The fact there was a lot of land area available in the air next to the glass factory, it means that we could introduce a solar farm or a wind farm so we could produce a lot more renewable energy than you would be able to do in central London because you are limited to the roofs of the buildings. While here you could use a much larger area. Adding electric vehicles is, is the same um, idea that you just use the trenching for the heat network piping to add the electric vehicle cables. 
we kind of proved that we could apply this concept there as well. I was born in Cornwall and grew up in a tin mining town in the 80s, so I've seen firsthand the devastating impact of the loss of a key local industry. Across the UK, there are so many ex-mining communities that suffer high levels of fuel poverty due to the combination of fragile local economies and rural locations off the main gas grid. I love the idea of storing heat in abandoned flooded mines and asked Dr Marques if those communities could benefit from the same approach. No, absolutely. I mean, if there is mine water, you, you can recover the heat from it. So again, why not? It's this untapped resource. And, and there is a lot of towns that have, and towns and cities that are, you know, and the coal mining areas. So you have the source next to the demand is, is the ideal combination. The issue is always with costs, I suppose, the, the cost of drilling. Um, and there needs to be a lot of research into what's the best place to drill to make sure that you have an, uh, enough of um, reservoir to recover all the heat that you need for the area. Now I was really excited. It wasn't just the prospect of decarbonizing heating. It was the inherent justice of potentially regenerating towns that have had the heart ripped out of them, that have been neglected for decades. Just imagine the impact that could have. I asked what someone should do if they shared that vision. What would be the next steps to take? I think the first step would always be to do a feasibility study. You need to have that research carried out. You need to look at what's the economic viability probably do a bit of a, a drill test just to, to, to make sure you're drilling in the right location. So it's true, it's complex, but the potential is there, so why not? Obviously, feasibility studies and drill testing are not things that a community group could do. But they could get help from an organisation like Friends of the Earth, who already supports an extensive network of local groups campaigning on things like this to help their local communities. Local people coming together to campaign for this would demonstrate public support for better ways to heat homes and encourage councillors to start the process off. Happily, Green Skies have created a centre of excellence to help local councils and other stakeholders to roll this out across the country. So we have a website that describes all the work we can do, you know, all the different partners and is, is looking at heat mapping, developing business models, uh, looking at uh, the um, economic viability, looking at the smart controls, looking at doing the community engagement. So we can, we can do all of that. And you can learn from our case studies, from other case studies that were funded through Innovate UK. So there is Definitely the knowledge is there, and we definitely want to continue to work in this area. You can find a link to that website in the show notes, by the way, along with a few other things you might find useful. But ideas are all well and good. What about the tricky issue of funding? I mean, there's opportunities to look for funding uh, within... um, government for heat networks. So there is a big funding pot, which is called the Green Heat Network Fund, which kind of funds 50%, I think, of a heat network cost, which is quite considerable. It can be a couple of millions. Of course, this doesn't include maintenance over the long term. And if we're creating the ideal solution here, I'd want leaseholders to be protected from billing shocks in the future. The other issue is the skill shortage, something Dr. Marques discussed with me. There is a skills shortage across all these sectors in the heating side, heating and cooling. As we roll out more heat pumps, there is not enough people to install them. That is a major issue. So we, we need to retrain people. So there's a big opportunity for that. I think if you if we tackle the skills shortage, that would be a major step forward. But then obviously there are other challenges. I mean, we're talking about electrifying, electrifying heat, electrifying transport. So 
um, the grid is not ready for that, so it needs to be reinforced. So that needs to be again. I was. This is not about money, but at the same time, <laughs> it's difficult not to come back to it because you need to deploy the infrastructure, and of course, you need uh, money for that. But the skills you could maybe with little invest capital investment, you can make such a big difference. To me, it seems that Green Skies is giving us a map, a clear path to not only decarbonised heating, power and transport infrastructure, but also to an economic rebirth of so many ex-industrial centres. Of course, this is not going to be the solution that suits every town. But just imagine if this could be rolled out in an ex-mining town, with investment in not just the technology, but in training people who would be able to not only install and maintain the system in their hometown, but in other places too. This could have a hugely beneficial ripple effect across entire communities. Because at the heart of all this is people. Going back to the Islington project, I asked Dr Marques about the benefits for the people who live there. For local residents, they get a local energy system that is decarbonised and they get better air quality. And one thing we did that is relatively innovative is we explored the option for the community to invest in the green sky system. And that would give them a certain level of decision making. We're not talking about investing uh, large amounts, maybe 1%, 2% of the total project uh, value, really. But it still gives them that voice. And for Islington Council, this project really fits into their goals of becoming a net zero borough by 2030. I mean, Green Skies is effectively uh, giving them a blueprint on how to get there. Definitely obvious benefits for them. In the system, we were connecting council-owned buildings. Um, we looked at connecting a university, a theater, and a few local businesses. So it was, again, different stakeholders, but for, for Islington residents in those council homes, they were getting um, cheaper energy, or the same price, let's say, energy, but low carbon. We also looked at buildings that are more difficult to decarbonize, uh, such as Georgian homes, and we came up with different solutions for the different building archetypes. The integrating of heat power and, and, and transport is, is really interesting in, in this project. And for the data center, so that waste heat provider, I mean, the fact that we would be recovering their waste heat improves their carbon metrics and is a way for them to give back to the, the local community. And then there's benefits associated with employment to, you know, build the network and operate it. I'm sure there is much more, actually. This is just the, 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 the first ones that come to mind, actually. And what about the people who worked on such a huge, complex project? With so many different specialisms needing to be considered, how did that work? It was really a diverse group of people with a wide range of expertise. Uh, there was a lot of women in group, um, a lot of age diversity. It was a very multicultural team. And the good thing is we hit it off from the start. So we were united by this common vision. And there was always this feeling about that we were creating something great. Uh, we were effectively integrating innovation across different sectors to develop a smart system that was equitable. And over time, the project evolved, so more partners joined the consortium, so we ended up with 15 partners, including two local authorities and small and large companies. And, you know, cooperation with all stakeholders, uh, you know, which include local authorities, the industry and business, local residents. It, this engagement and cooperation was key. And we had three partners in the consortium that were just looking at stakeholder engagement because we realized how critical this was to, for the project to be successful, because it's not just about the technology, it's about taking people on the journey with you. It's about taking people on the journey with you. 
I want to take a moment to think about that. As a shy, nerdy science fiction writer, my natural instinct is to always focus on the technology. And it feels like we've been told that if we get the technology right, all of our problems would be solved for the past 70 years. But technology can only do so much. And the power of people that come together to solve a huge problem can be formidable. An example of that is the Kum Aryan Renewable Energy Project. Now, this story is quite remarkable, about a rural community living within a landscape dotted with huge wind turbines who decided to build one for themselves to benefit the local people. This is in Pembrokeshire. So that's the kind of bottom left bit of Wales that sticks out a bit. It's famous for being the source of the, the blue stones from Stonehenge. So it's it's kind of a, there's a lot of history and mythology surrounding the area, which is quite fun. That's Daniel Blackburn, who's a director and the treasurer for Cum Aryan Renewable Energy. The problem that community wanted to solve was how to produce their own renewable energy. As they're in Wales, harnessing wind power was the obvious choice to benefit the people living nearby. They settled upon this as their vision in 2004. Then they managed to get some funding to do a feasibility study. But that was just the start. Yeah, so from visioning to building the turbine, it was it was 15, 15 years, so it was a long old process. Along the way, we managed to get support, so we were successful in, in getting the Low Carbon Communities Challenge funding, and that's what we've done along the way. We've managed to get little bits of help along the way. Actually, Comarian was um, constituted in 2011, so the actual organisation has been going since 2011. And shortly after that, we went into a four-year planning hi hiatus sort of thing. So we, we planned to, to produce a wind turbine, and that took, um, you know, four years, which, yeah, was quite a long battle that we had to be very patient throughout. But over the years that it took to get planning permission, the financial landscape that underpinned the project had changed. Their funding model depended upon the feed-in tariff, a government scheme that had been introduced in 2010 to incentivise people to install their own renewable energy generation, like solar panels, by paying them for electricity they sold to the grid via their energy supplier. This amount was reduced in 2016, the year the turbine finally got planning permission. We then had a struggle to get a, a, you know, an economic model which would, would go forward. Some of the subsidies that we needed weren't there anymore. So what was a fantastic economic proposition then became a struggle of something to finance. So we worked for another couple of years working that out. And fortunately, we managed to get um, a cheaper a turbine than what we had originally hoped. And so that enabled the project to go ahead. And the wind turbine then was um, finished in, in the end of 2019, which was just before we lost all the, the feed-in tariff. So we managed to get right in on the, the end of, of accessing, you know, a, a small bit of, of feed-in tariff, which has helped us. Even though the turbine itself turned out to be cheaper, it still cost £1.3 million to construct. £1.3 million. How on earth can any community group finance that? Well, we managed to, to fund it through the support of the Development Bank of Wales. Um, so they've seen the value of this project and we've been able to take that loan, which is it's a good interest rate, which has allowed us to do this project. But most community energy projects get that money by raising share capital you know, they'll do a share offer and, and millions has been in, been raised on different projects. So, and, and so there are people wanting to invest in these kinds of projects because of the benefits they offer and they're good investments. I asked Daniel what advice he would give to anyone listening to this who would love to establish their own community renewable energy project. 
our example says, you know, start now (laughs) because these projects take a while, you know, start and keep going. You know, there is a huge amount of, of support out there. So in each of the of all the um, nations, um, whether that's Scotland, Northern Ireland, England or Wales, there is a community energy organised... Well, there's like a... We have Community Energy Wales, there's Community Energy England, and these are groups which are, you know, federations of, of, of community energy organisations which are there to help fledgling community energy groups get off the ground... In relation to other groups which may be struggling, all we can say is, you know, when it all, does all come together, the results are amazing. There's such a huge array of benefits from community energy, whether it's the economics for the local community, whether it's the resilience that that creates within society and what that does for community vitality. You know, there's a social and political potential changes that that community energy brings. You know, we haven't mentioned climate breakdown and addressing that. There's something also to be said for for mental well-being. So with tackling, you know, the, the, the climate breakdown, you know, it gives you the kind of strength to maybe look the future generation in the eye, in the eye and say, we did everything that we could to, to address this situation. And, the, you know, the other thing to say is that you know if you have a tight group of people that are mobilized to deliver a community energy project and it's a big project then that creates a multiplier effect for the community this has been our experience it's been the experience of other organizations that there are lots of donors who want to get the money straight out into the, into the community and if you're a group of people who can you know have a cash flow you know have an enterprise which is generating money then you can get support with tackling other important issues in your community. So, you know, I see that as a huge benefit as well. And this, to me, is where it gets really exciting. Because the Kum Aryan project is a prime example of that ripple effect I mentioned earlier. Since then, as an organisation, I think with the confidence of of delivering, you know, as a £1.3 million project... Um, we've gone on to do lots of other projects. Um, so we've kind of stopped being a volunteer-based organisation and we have a staff base and we've been able to pull in other resources which deliver sustainability to the community. So we've gone into protecting and enhancing local biodiversity. We've gone into um, supporting people with energy efficiency and fuel poverty. We we go round people's houses and you know assess the simple things that they can do. We we do these participatory um, thermal imaging surveys. So we stick a great big um, extractor fan on people's houses and essentially cap- create a, a bit of a vacuum and then go round with a thermal imaging camera and see where the cold air is coming in. And then people know then you know how to draft proof their houses. We've developed social enterprises looking at you know farm waste to make compost and biochar. We do a lot with local food, so we do local uh, fruit juicing during the, the apple season. And then we've also created a creative sustainability hub um, to run courses on a lot of these things, helping people in our community and groups. Um, so we've built this very nice... Uh, eco build structure which is produced out of local round wood and also hempcrete and you know it has solar panels and eco heating and so um, it's quite a funky little place to do workshops where we do kind of clothes repairs we've done um, making diy wind turbines and um, lots of different crafts as well Because of the way the law works in regards to the production of electricity being fed into the national grid, the energy produced by the Kum Aryan turbine cannot directly be sold to the local community who built it. This came up when I asked Daniel if there was one thing he could change. The piece of legislation going through the House of Commons, which is the energy bill, you know, the bill has been created, it went to the House of Lords, and the House of the Lords inserted a private bill um, called the Local Energy Bill, which has been 
um, supported by a campaign called Power for People. It's put two clauses in to, to support community energy. And those two ways of supporting community energy are allowing community energy organisations to sell their energy direct to local consumers and also to get a kind of a guaranteed price to take out the fluctuations in the market. Now, you know, this these extra clauses came back um, to the committee deciding on this. They, they've stripped those clauses out. So we now have to see how government, you know, MPs vote on, on this. But it seems crazy that, you know, these two pieces of additional legislation to promote community energy, you know, have been removed despite the fact that there's, you know, widespread support, you know, among all parties for these these additions. Yeah, if I change anything, yeah, put those clauses back in. You know, why this is so important is currently it's quite difficult for us as a community energy organisation to, to sell directly to our consumers. And if we can do that, you know, we could lessen the blow of you know these energy shocks by by keeping energy prices down even though they can't directly reduce the community's energy bills they are still playing a part in decarbonizing electricity production and the profits of the turbine are ploughed back into the community you know i like to think of this this model um, with community energy which was developed by i think the new economics foundation it's this thing of plugging the leaks. So if you have a rural economy and you imagine it, it's a leaky bucket, money comes in to our local economy from tourism, farming, but it isn't a huge amount. But all that wealth flows out. And where does it flow out to? That wealth he is talking about is the money everyone pays for energy. International power companies, shareholders, sellers of fossil fuels that are used in power stations or individual houses, all that money leaving the local community to pay for a resource that everyone needs. Now, if we could keep that in Wales, and we can do that by having community energy, then, you know, instead of all that money leaving, it stays. And, you know, what you find, you know, in, in CARE's example, in our example, when the money stays in the community then we tackle the issues locally so you know there is the money then to tackle fuel poverty community energy gives that hopefully gives that option to decouple from you know the boom bust and extracting of wealth from poor people because it it is essentially you know with energy it's, it's an asset transfer everybody has to have energy when the market's high the big corporations make money and you're taking the money from the populace and and giving it to corporations and community energy is the best way in my mind to break that cycle and address that social injustice issue. There are so many community groups doing amazing things with community-owned renewable energy. A social enterprise in Ogwen Valley, again in Wales, has expanded the use of community-owned hydropower to support a pool of electric bikes, electric cars and an electric minibus that are available to rent by the local community. Expanding out from this, they've established a broad variety of projects that support the local community, help its economy and the environment, alongside celebrating its language and culture. You can find a link to a video all about them in the show notes. It's wonderful. One of my favourite things about science fiction is exploring the way that advancements in technology can change the way we live. If you fancy having a go at looking at how a single change could impact upon the world, I'll be giving you something else to fuel your imagination right at the end of the episode. All of the technology we've explored in this episode so far is far from speculative. It's readily available right now. It's a matter of tackling infrastructure upgrades, skill shortages and financing, rather than needing to invent something that doesn't exist yet. I spoke to Anne Charnock, award-winning fellow near-future science fiction author, to discuss the ways that overcoming those barriers could change people's lives. We both agreed on what was at the heart of both the Green Skies and Kum Aryan projects. 
So I think what brought these two projects together was the idea of decentralization, bringing people and communities to the center of decision making rather than it being top down. You know, it needs to be bottom up uh, with a bit of clever thinking about assessing what do you have? What do you have that you can build on? And it might be, yes, it might be district heating. You've already got the system, people understand it. But it could be that you've got good opportunities, say, on derelict land for solar power, or you've got roof space that you can use on a tower block for solar panels. I think it came across quite clearly there that it was a question of doing feasibility studies, but bringing the decisions very close to the community. Anne is no stranger to community-led projects, having been heavily involved in a project aiming to be England's first carbon-neutral village back in 2005. The village as a whole decided that they would aim to reduce their carbon footprint by conservation, energy conservation, lifestyle change. And the way we were able to measure this was that the University of Chester got involved because one of their lecturers lived in our community. So we started off by simple energy saving measures like looking at light bulbs, looking at reducing the temperature on thermostats, what have you. And it just became a community project and it was, it, there was no top down, there was no committee saying do this, do that. It was more individual citizens saying, I have an idea, let's try this. And everyone shared ideas, if they were changing a boiler, which boiler to use. And then we persuaded the local council, because we were getting a lot of publicity, uh, a lot of media attention, uh, that we asked the council if they would build us a footpath from our village to the next village where there was a railway station, because it was too dangerous a road to walk along. And they agreed. So it was really great that we had that really building that footpath rather than building a turbine or anything was the big game changer. And it was a kind of a quick result. It came about two, three years into the project. It was only after about five years when we found that the community was saving about 40% of their energy usage. And aside from the benefit of reducing the carbon footprint, what was the impact of this on the community? The main benefit was that in terms of people feeling happier, people feeling like they were doing something, and although the headlines were coming in all the time about climate change, people were starting to feel a bit desperate in the kind of wider world. Within Ashton Hayes, people's mental health was a lot better. This was not an expected outcome from the project. And that ripple effect that the Cum Aryan project has seen. Did something similar happen in Ashton Hayes? Because of the success and because of the media attention, people started almost having this can-do attitude. You know, if, if we identified a problem in the community, there would be a group say, well, we'll sort that out. Like we started a community shop. Uh, We managed to get funding to build a sports pavilion with solar panels. People just felt energised. I think that's what I would say. We set up a community interest company that harnessed all the energy we were generating from solar panels on our sports pavilion and on the school and used that energy to fund both the pavilion and the school and the excess then sold to the grid. So that's still ongoing, and the money that's generated, we spend on community projects. So it's kind of stopping the money leaving. And I think this is something that Daniel was talking about, about how the money is sucked out of a community, whereas it's ideal if you have a more independent energy generation project that you keep that money in your community. I'm not saying that either of these projects are the only solution to decarbonising heating and power. Indeed, to do that on the scale of the entire country, the majority of renewable energy will probably come from offshore wind, and that's far beyond the reach of community groups. But what I do want to do is imagine what the impact of more local solutions could be, 
small-scale projects that can be rolled out alongside and in concert with other large-scale solutions. I've talked about money staying in the community, about renewable energy generation run by and for a local community, about a bold vision for decarbonising heating, energy and transportation, and potentially regenerating ex-mining towns. But really, what lies underneath all of this is empowerment. Whether it's a team of scientists bringing together different specialists and stakeholders to decarbonise energy infrastructure and reduce air pollution, or whether it's a group of people who look at all the wind turbines in their landscape and say, hey, what if we had one of those? These are real people bringing the power back into local communities. So what if it was scaled up? What if more and more communities and local authorities did similar things? This is what Anne said when I asked her that question. The, the main impact would be, as, as I mentioned earlier, that money kept, was kept local rather than being extracted from our own resources, our own wind power, our own solar power. We harness those resources for our good rather than feeling as though we're being used it would perhaps restore a bit of faith in governance in general, that if people felt they had a little bit more control over their lives. I mean, the the landscape, the cities and rural areas might change. You might start to see more windmills going up, more solar farms, even methane digesters intersecting sewers. You know, it it could be that we, we have different infrastructure And in a way, it's almost like a retro development, things being centralised, that centralisation being relaxed. I would like to think that we might see a slightly different landscape, certainly in rural areas, with each sizeable community having its own energy generation. And with their own energy generation, with more money kept local, With communities empowered to tackle the problems caused by chronic underinvestment, what else could flourish? The Islington Green Skies project shows that there is a huge amount of sense in looking at heating and cooling across thousands of buildings, instead of leaving the entire burden of decarbonisation on the shoulders of residents who can't afford it. The Cum Aryan project and the Ashton Hayes community show that when you can earn money as a community from generating renewable energy, the entire community can benefit. As I stand at my window, watching the plumes of heating exhaust spiral into the autumn air, struggling to pay my bills, I know there is a better way than living like this. And we can make it happen. You've just listened to an episode of Imagining Tomorrow, brought to you in partnership with Friends of the Earth. It was researched, written and produced by Emma Newman. To find out more about Emma's work, go to www.enewman.co.uk. If you'd like to find out more about how Friends of the Earth can help you and your local community to take action on a wide variety of issues, not just making the decarbonisation of heating possible for the majority of people, then go to foe.uk forward slash community hyphen group. Details about the people featured in this episode can be found in the show notes, along with some resources you might find helpful. Have you got a similar story of hope and innovation to share? Have you been inspired by this episode? Tell me about it. You can email me at podcast at enewman.co.uk. Before I go, here's something to fuel your imagination. I asked Daniel what he would invent if he could. Um, Hydrogen technology has a lot to offer. It's, It's essentially what we can do to to store energy from from renewables that we can use elsewhere so the technology does exist to produce hydrogen but at the moment it can't be done efficiently so basically a a cost-effective way of capturing the renewable energy in hydrogen and and being able to utilize it either for storage or for for transport would be a good one 
If we could find a cost-effective and carbon-neutral way to produce hydrogen from renewable energy sources, how do you think that could change the world? I hope that you're inspired to imagine a better tomorrow. <laughs>